Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of Cats Chats. <laughs> oh, I, no, sorry. I mean, yes, that is what we, what it is. Uh, the Knicks Film School podcast, in which we have chatting with us today, uh, the one and only Fred Katz of The Athletic. Fred, I, I just sprung that on you. Do you like that nickname? I have to say, so I think maybe the proudest moment of my career is that I've I've come on and dragged every fucking one of you to my level. It I have ruined I've dragged ruined Andrew this down. podcast. Yeah, I totally dragged. Andrew used to be like, oh, you can't change your name. You gotta be a pro. You got you gotta be you gotta be well behaved on here. And then I come on, I start talking about the Detroit Pistons and changing my name on the YouTube and whatever else. And and now Andrew is just helpless. There's nothing he can do about it. And I have to say, my plan of completely ruining this podcast is just working out wonderfully. John, I think you it can... It used to be so good. John, I think you can appreciate this yes. the, as a teacher. Um, maybe even as a parent. Sometimes you got to pick the battles you know you can win. And <laughs> at a certain point, you're just like, you know what? He's on oh, the yeah. pod. He's talking about the Knicks. We're we're good. We we we. And, and I'm a child. <laughs> I'm a child. It's I'm good. a child with with horrific just ADHD that overrides every single thing that I do. Whenever somebody's like, "How did you think of that?" My response is always, "I have a horrible ADHD and mm. I am uncontrollable to every single degree." So, Andrew, I'm glad you noticed that. I don't know why you guys keep having me back. It's terrible for the show. I it it's because despite your greatest efforts, you're actually really good at your job. So <laughs> we will we will expand upon how good you are at your job now in talking about Emmanuel quickly. I, I all I, like Andrew is like oh he's like please just let them talk about the fucking basketball team that the podcast is supposed to be about so people will keep listening. <laughs> So to me, extension Monday, or if you want to take it even a step further and just say extension season, but really it was like you, you, you know, the Cole Anthony one was another one that was, that was around, uh, uh, Neesmith's money a little bit more, right. Than three, for money. Thir- three for 39, but I think it's team option in the third year. Right. Oh, that's a nice. So it's like, then. you know, it's, it's like, you know, about 26 million guaranteed or something like that. I don't remember the structure. Yeah. Uh, Josh green, uh, three for 41. Um, so these are all young, obviously, because rookie extensions, talented bench players with upside who, in theory, over the next several years could be either low end starters or high end subs for their team. And that bring very real, very translatable in terms of like it could you could see it working on a bevy of different teams, NBA skills. And then you have Devin Vassell. And Jade McDaniels, who are, I don't want to say low end starters, but like, I don't know, are either of those guys ever going to be the third best player on a on a top five team? Maybe, certainly could it could be in the cards, right? I'm not going to rule it out. Well, right, when your when your best player is Victor Wembanyama, <laughs> you could do a lot of. Or things. your best player, then like maybe he could because maybe it doesn't matter who the second or That's, third best player. Is. Okay. Putting that aside, I also, I the, also love yeah. Devin Vassell. Like, I think Devin Vassell is going to be. I, I thought that was a little expensive, but I'm like, so okay. I totally foresee this a world in which he's good on that contract. The reason Devin Vassell got 135 million dollars for five years is because he's young and averaged 19 points a game. Sure, and he, yeah, he did yeah. it on a bad team and put up those numbers. But he's young. He's a wing. He's a good defender. And he's a good three point shooter and he can create his own shot. And if you can do all of those things and you're young, right. you are getting paid, period. It's like, especially if you can def- just how it works, especially if you and it's amazing. And this is going to lead to my point. The you would not think watching Josh Green and Cole Anthony, and we don't need to get into their games. That's the point that I'm trying to make. You would think watching Josh Green, Cole Anthony, Aaron S with who, you know, even if you want to throw Avdia in there. Um, that there would not be a hundred million dollars essentially of difference between them at, at that level of player and the level of player that we have seen thus far from Devin Vassell and and Jane McDaniels, but you just nailed it 
when you do all those things and you're whatever, what is Vassell? Six, five, six, six, big wingspan. So it's like six, he plays six, tall. six, six yeah. with a big wingspan. Big, and he can, wing, guard, big wingspan. he can guard big wings is really what, it, what it comes down to is what can you guard? It, he can you. guard big wings. You can, you can put him on like, like Quentin Grimes, the Knicks would put on Pascal Siakam, but that's an uncomfortable, better. not ideal experience for Quentin Grimes. Quentin Grimes, you want on, on, on guards. Ideally, that's where he's at his best. Devin Vassell, you can put on Pascal Siakam and that's yes. within his, his, his budget, you know? And, and Jay McDaniels, you could put him on the guys that on the big wings and you could put him on the guys that Quentin Grimes should be guarding. Cause that dude, Really good defender, defensive player. He also, he also had all the leverage in the world. That's not to wow. me a very comparable situation. Like when he's like the guy no, we won't trade, I, the guy we won't give up. Like, like teams. That's how a guy gets leverage in those sorts of situations. I'm, you know? I'm not trying to compare the reasons why Vassell and the reasons why McDaniel's got paid. I'm, I, but I do think the fact that they both got essentially the same number is notable and it, it, um, it, there's a long winding way to get back to quickly where it's like, okay, you're Leon Rose. Emmanuel quickly could do a lot of things in the next 82 games or how many games they, they play this season growing three or four inches and becoming the sort of player who, as you just said, you are what you could defend in the NBA who, who can defend across the board, who becomes that sort of a piece and we could talk up and down about how Emmanuel quickly is he one of the five best off ball guard defenders in the league? I don't know. Maybe that's underselling it. Maybe he's one of the three best. I don't know. Whatever you want to put him at, there is a, to me, this came down to that. And it came down to Leon Rose making a calculated risk of, okay, what is my worst case scenario? What are the odds that I hit that worst case scenario with whatever quickly does this year? And then what is my best case scenario? And what are the odds we end up with something closer to the best case scenario? And he looked at all those scenarios. And I think he just basically decided, I, I given what quickly wants, which we'll get into in a second, the odds that this is really going to come back and bite me in the ass in a big way. I just don't think I'm speaking as Leon Rose. I just don't think that they're there because we live in an NBA economy where there are certain types of players who get those paydays. And I think Leon Rose just flatly believes that Emmanuel quickly is not nothing. He does this year is going to put him into that category. And if he, and last thing, and I'll throw it to you. And if he does get himself into that category, well, shit, that's a great problem to have because that means Emmanuel quickly went out and did something this year where it's like, some team thinks that he is worth upwards of 30 million or 25 plus million dollars. That's my read on this thing with a, a day or so to, to let it marinate. And I, I want to get your response to all that. Can we talk about the NBA economy that you just mentioned? Sure, please. Cause that, I think that's very under discussed in, in this 100%. entire conversation. I'm pretty sure, unless I'm forgetting about somebody a Kongwu got 62 million guaranteed. And then after him, the only guys who got more were the Max guys and then Vassell and McDaniels. Like, I think there's no one between Vassell and a Kongwu when you go through the contracts, right? No, there's no one. Right? It was Pat, Pat, right? Uh, okay. Pat didn't sign. Yeah. Right. Pat Williams didn't sign. So, and, and Maxi didn't sign. And, Different situation. And, yeah. Different situation for sure. And Pat Williams is actually a really good example because he probably is someone who could have justified somewhere in that same salary range as quickly. Good defender, lots of size. Like what Pat quickly Williams, wanted or what they were offering quickly? What they were offering. Okay. Like he's you could have justified, like, I don't know, you could have job justified. 16 million, 20 million, 22 million, something in that range. Like if you saw that, we wouldn't have been, oh my goodness, they gave Pat Williams 80 million over four years. Because what is but, Pat Williams? He's a big fucking wing who could defend other big wings and he totally. showed the ability to shoot, even though he is far, well, maybe not far more, more theoretical than Vassell and uh, certainly McDaniels. And he's a former number four pick, which shouldn't yeah, well, matter. Matters, I get but it, it but it does. I mean, look what the Knicks gave RJ. Yeah. It matters. It totally matters. And, and the reason I bring this up is because you get up to the territory where Okongwu is four years, 62 mil. And then all of a sudden, the next most expensive contract, you're up to Devin Vassell at 135. Mm -hmm. It's a $73 million jump. And Vassell's five years, so it's it's not as much average annual value. But four but for 62 is is about 
mid-level money. It's a little more than mid-level money. And what we are going to see in the NBA economy moving forward, or at least the way these extensions are signed, what at least what agents, what teams are telling us they anticipate the market being like, teams are expecting the middle class to be priced out. Players are either going to get wildly overpaid or they are going to have to take the mid-level or under. And I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had in the last couple of days who are just like, oof, hope quickly doesn't get Austin Reeves. And that was a different situation where, where Austin Reeves ends up signing for the most amount of money that the Lakers could have possibly given him because he was an arenas rule guy. So it's a little bit different. But the context is Austin Reeves was a restricted free agent. And restricted free agency is notoriously unfriendly to guys. It's hard to get paid. And it might be a little bit easier to get paid now that they changed the offer sheet rules from 48 hours to 24 hours in the new CBA. But, but it is much harder. First of all, the best way to get to get paid in restricted free agency is with a sign in trade. Yeah. Sign in trades are way harder now. Salary matching get, is way harder. I don't want to derail you, but I want to get back to that because I want to I want to pick your brain more on that. Keep going, though. Yeah. Sa- salary matching is going to be way harder. And then there are certain teams with the second apron rule. If you're over the second apron, you can't do a sign. Or you're over the first apron, I think. You can't do a sign and trade. If you're over the first apron, you can't do a sign and trade. So, like... You can't, ex- it, you can't be the one if you are over the first apron. You cannot which, acquire a player who is being signed and stuck, traded. And then traded to you. you. Over Got the it. first apron. So it's just going to be, and salary matching rules are, are, are tougher, even tougher starting percent as opposed to the 125. Yeah. Oh, next season's a hundred or you get hard capped. That's at the first apron. It's a hundred percent at the first apron at the first apron. So if you, no one's talking about this, it is huge. Trades are going to be so much more difficult because if you make a trade, let's put this in layman's terms. We don't have to, I'm not going to use the word salary matching. I'm not going to use percentages or anything like that. If you starting July 1st and moving forward in perpetuity, if you make a trade in which you bring in more money than you're giving out, even if it's one cent more, you're hard capped at the first apron. They're going to be, it's just going to make trading way harder. Half the league, more than half the league is going to have to be hard capped. And by the way, because so much of the league, is going to be hard capped. So much of the league that wasn't previously hard capped is going to be hard capped. What's going to happen? Total dollars spent is going to be down. And when total dollars spent are down, you get a deviation of middle from the middle class. You get people getting bogged down to the mid-level exception and below. And the mid-level exception, by the way, is not even going to be as prominent because you can also now use it as a trade exception. I think the players got wiped on this deal. I really do. And and that's, I think, why you saw like 15 extensions off rookie scale deals in one in one rookie class. That's a lot. This is not normal to have no, 15. It's, well, it's a record. The record was 12. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I didn't even realize it was a record. I knew it was that's a ton. Bob, Bobby Marks had tweeted that out. I, there you go. Well, no Bobby is as great as there is at that job. So I'm sure that's there. correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's there's a reason that's a record. There's a reason there's that record. It, there are a lot of agents who are like, just take the money. Just take well, the money. They're really nervous about there being no middle class. Speaking of Bobby, him and the point that him and, and Zach Lowe made on the recent pod was that how do you get these guys to sign? Well, you, if you give them a little bit more than mid-level money, that's when I think what you're saying comes into play where it's like the agent is telling the player like, Take this now because it's more than if it's more than mid level money, it's more than you're likely to get in this new economy. And as you're talking, I can't help but think back to, and it was funny because we were both briefly on with him at the same time during what I forget what the what the app was. Jake Fisher towards the end of last season, which I think we when we talked to him before the new CBA was ratified, right? It was like in March or something. But I remember I asked him about quickly or, or quickly came up or something, and he said back then exactly the same thing that you said to me, so, I mean, clearly this is the type of thing making rounds, making the rounds in NBA uh, front offices that like the middle class is just going to get wiped. And like what, you know, quickly is right there on the precipice of like, is he, is he someone that is going to now look it, all it takes is one team, right. To, to, to justify that they justify to themselves. We are making a bet on this guy. Let's, uh, let's stop there for half a second. That is the worst case scenario, right? 
for Leon Rose that it's wh- whoever the team may be, San Antonio, Orlando, Detroit, pick a team, says we're making our bet on this guy and pick the number. Isn't that the worst case scenario? Well, what do you mean by worst case scenario? Day, July, whatever, free agency opens. Detroit, let's choose Detroit. Sure, well, actually, that's probably not a good one because they have a lot of, they have some. Orlando. 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 Fine. It's Orlando. Um, Orlando shows up to Emmanuel Cookley's door and says, maybe not the max, but here, four for 120 with a fourth year player option and a, a trade kicker. And what else, I don't know what else you could throw in. Any other bad shit that you could throw in. Here it is. And quickly signs it. Is that not? That's a problem for Leon Rose, is it not? Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay, so you answer my question. Because then you're risking either losing quickly for nothing or paying a guy more than you want to pay him. Uh, or you could potentially look. Teams always try to avoid offer sheets. They are always trying to avoid offer sheets. In a situation like that, you might be able to work a sign and trade. That's something yeah. where you might be able to do it, uh, and, and and that could get. You know, that could get a, a big trade exception for somebody too. Uh, so, so there are, you know, there are maybe ways you could go about it. Quickly is also difficult to work in a sign and trade in Orlando. It's not the case because they have the cap space, but he's so going to be a base year. He's going to be a base year compensation guy, which I, I don't know. We, we have to be off the air at, at some point tonight. And base year compensation is so complicated. I think it would take into like into like January for me to finish discussing it. Basically well, what it means is that a guy's outgoing trade number is different than his incoming trade number. And it makes it really hard to sign and trade a guy who's the, getting a big raise on his current salary. The cliff notes uh, version is that you, if you aggregate enough salary in the total trade with, with more and more money added into the trade, it lessens and lessens and lessens the impact of the base year compensation issue for sure. Which, but, and there are other issues. For sure. Or you find a third team or that. And, but that's not the case that we're talking about here. We're talking about quickly going out and getting a big contract. Yes. Why in the world would the Knicks be like, oh, okay, well then for a sign and trade, we're also going to throw RJ Barrett in there. You know, like they're not going to be like, oh yeah, let's do this and give you RJ Barrett too. The, yeah. the only scenario in which compiling all those, uh, the only scenario in which compiling all those salaries really works with like a two teamer is if you're Colin Sexton, right? Mm-hmm. Colin Sexton's a restricted That's free the one agent. I was thinking of. Yeah, his market's getting totally squeezed. And then all of a sudden in September, when Sexton hasn't even signed yet, uh, he ends up doing a sign and trade as part of the Donovan Mitchell deal. Sexton got lucky though, right? Like his market got really squeezed and he could sign for that. What was it? 471, four for 72. Yeah. He could sign for that number because that was the number required to make the math work in the Donovan Mitchell trade. And you so was like all too happy to to pay him whether whether that was his market value or not. That they were totally, but there were not, other things that were getting out of that. Not all restricted guys get that lucky. It just I I I don't mean to sound is. I'm actually more optimistic for quickly you're getting not, paid than I'm making it sound right now. You're not sounding anything. I I, think I just, just I just want to make yeah. I just I just want to make it clear that like. He's taking a risk. Like he's oh. definitely, he's definitely taking a risk. If he comes out this year and he's better than he was last year and he has an awesome postseason, so, like he'll get paid and he'll get, he'll get paid more than 16 or 18 million a year. Like he'll I mean, get, he'll get more than that. I want to make an argument to you. One, well, I'll just first ask you. What? What does that look like to you, him ha- him coming out and having a better season than he had last year? Well, realistically, on this team with all of these pieces here. Well, first of all, it would be him having a killer playoff run. That's an easy one. If he if if I mean, there are guys who have terrible regular seasons, have 12 awesome playoff games and all of a sudden get Jerome James contracts, you know? That's how this league works. So if you have another really good regular season and then you take it to another level in the playoffs, you catch some hot streak in the playoffs. Like to me, one thing I'd concern about, and this was something that was brought up to me by somebody in the league of like one of the risks he's taking is he was not great in the playoffs as a rookie and everybody shook it off as like, whatever, he's a rookie. 
He was not great for them in the playoffs last year. At least he wasn't like the best version of himself in the playoffs last year. And he gets a deserved, I don't want to say he gets a pass for it because we've written about it. We've talked about it, but he's not like under scrutiny. Nobody's out there being like Emmanuel quickly can't play in the playoffs. Uh, And I don't think anybody should be thinking that. However, there is a trope that small guards struggle more in the playoffs. And if he comes out a third time and struggles in the Knicks playoff run and then hits free agency, that's not going to be good for his free agent odds either. But what would quickly looking better this year be? Added patience as a ball handler, pick a roll guy. Okay. Uh, that's something that I think is extremely realistic, if not expected. He has become more patient. He has become more intelligent as a ball handler and a pick and roll handler every year of his career. I don't see why that progression shouldn't continue this year. And I would expect that it would. His jump shot can be more consistent. He shot 37 from three last year. He could shoot 40. Sure. Like he could just shoot 40 from three. All of a sudden he could just start draining just be a better pull-up shooter. The shot selection can be better. As good of a player as he is, there are still those times because he's so ultra confident that you're just like, ooh, you just you don't love that fade away at the nail with 14 <laughs> on the shot clock. You know, you just don't yeah. you don't want that. Um, and I think his his general cadence can be better. And maybe he can be a better on ball defender. Maybe okay. he can find ways to be a better on ball defender. Cause you, I, I agree with your evaluation of his off ball defense. I've written about it. I've talked about you it. Him. I think he's fabulous. Oh, I, get it from. Off the ball. <laughs> I think he's fabulous off the ball. Yeah. He's, he's just a wonderful off ball defender. And he's, he's so smart. He's such a student of the game and takes so much. It's not just that he takes pride in that. Like he, he is obsessive studying other teams habits and obsessive about basketball minutia like honestly i i he's just like like he's nerdy enough to be on this podcast you know what i mean <laughs> like you know how there's like a there, you know how there's like a nerdy there's a requirement of having to be a certain level of nerd in order to be on this podcast like no one cool no one cool has ever been on this podcast right what Clyde Frazier has been on this podcast oh i take it all back just one cool person just been on this podcast. yes they literally the coolest person in the ever. world so he makes yes. up for all the people like you who are not cool. He's so cool. He doesn't have to be cool. That's what it exactly. is, like you know, but there's a level of, of basketball nerdiness and geekiness yeah. you need to have to be Jeremy Cohen and well, Jonathan Macri, you know, and me and Benji Ritholtz, you know, you need it. Yeah. And, and he, fits and, right uh, in. he fits, he fits right in. He's just a huge basketball nerd. And it, it shows in the way that he plays. It's why I actually think that he is, he cares about the right thing. So, so I do think he's going to progress in those ways. And I talk to people around the team and they're all tell me, they're like, he's going to be better this year. I'm like, okay, I, I believe it. Why not? He's 24. He's gotten better every year of his career. Why the heck won't he be better this year? I would expect him to be. So if he's better this year and he comes out, you know, I don't know how different the counting numbers are going to be because they have so many guards and so many guys who can play that role and whatever. But if all of a sudden he's just a better basketball player and and like I said, he's awesome off the ball, but that's by far his best trait. They almost never use him on like a high usage ball handler, partly because he's so good off the ball, but also because he can get kind of muscled. Yeah. And and if he can if he can get better on the ball too, that's another way. I mean, I think there are lots of ways that that he can improve, some some more obvious and some more nuanced. If he gets better on the ball, I wonder of all of everything you said and everything I love that you went through that because that's a really detailed explanation. If he gets better on the ball on on ball defense and he really becomes someone that proves himself that like ones, maybe like combo guards are not going to be able to bully him. I wonder if that would give some even further embolden some team as from from the perspective of like, well, maybe he doesn't have to always be our point guard. Maybe he really can be a two in a lot of lineups, you know. Um, but you know, it, I don't know. You you just said um, a minute ago that he cares about the right things. This has been something that has been said about him. I feel like it's since the day he was drafted. Do you think? I think I know the answer to this. Do you think the Knicks have any concerns about the fact that now he is? even more so playing for a contract that his you're shaking your head. His decision-making will change. Okay. So I got that answer. Nah. I mean, 
what's what's going to change? He's going to he's going to chuck up a fadeaway at the nail with 14 seconds left on the shot clock down. <laughs> like what's what's he going to yeah. do? I mean, if anything, it'll change for the better. OK, you know, that's a good answer. <laughs> like. He he recognizes what a good basketball player. Li- you know, there are some guys who I think they like want to get paid, but the reason that all of a sudden they're just gunning to score and doing all those things is because their recognition of what makes a good basketball player is not correct. You know, wow. uh, great line. Quick, Quickly's wiring is different. Like Quickly's idol is Drew Holiday. You know, he he he's he loves. Actually, I should take that back. His favorite player is Steph Curry, but his oh, really. Guy- yeah, I didn't know that. Which is a good answer. But his his Great his answer. favorite guy to like study is Drew Holiday. Um Drew Drew and him like have a relationship now. He reached out to him because he wanted to learn about defense from him because he respects his defense so much. And Drew kind of has taken him somewhat under his wing and, and taught him about the game and defense and all that kind of stuff. That's not, you know, sometimes you hear in pre-draft workouts, you hear teams a question that players will often ask or our teams will often ask players is who do you think your nba comp is and the reason they ask it is because it's a way to see okay what's this guy think of himself because if this guy is going to go on draft and he says i think i'm like a kevin durant <laughs> uh then you're like okay well maybe he's not for us yeah. uh and if and and if he says i think i'm a danny green then you're like Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. I get that. Um, and so, and so with quickly, I don't know how he would answer that question. I do know just from talking basketball with him a good amount over the last few years, I've been on the beat. I I know what he cares about in basketball and what he, what he wants to do in order to get better. And the things he cares about and getting better are like, You know, like that anecdote that I wrote about last year when he just like bragged to me after the game about his awesome pre-rotation on Isaac Okoro, you know, like those are the things he cares about. He's really nerdy about this stuff and he's confident and he's even cocky on the court and his shot selection comes into question. But I don't think he's going to be like, oh, I need to get paid. So now my usage needs to go through the roof because he knows that's not how it works. Like he's not dumb, you know? Sure. No, absolutely. That's great to hear. And it's funny. I don't know why this just clicked for me, but like, as you're talking one possibility that I don't know, maybe you've talked about, or I don't think you wrote this explicitly, but like, because maybe it's obvious there is just a chance that like the Nixon quickly agree to a new contract next summer. Like this, we're talking about all these different possibilities of sign and trades and offer sheets and this, that, and the other thing. It's like, maybe he just, maybe they're just, it's easier to, for them to come to an agreement with an additional year of evidence under both of their respective belts. Yep. Totally. Completely on the table. Yeah. Um, Com- completely on the table. I mean, look, it's not like the Knicks don't like quickly. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I don't want to, I've heard numbers. That were so I, that was the other question. Can, can yeah, you, so what I've, can you, what can you say? I've heard numbers. I, I don't like, I don't know if I should like throw them out there because what? Because I don't, I don't know exactly when they were put out there. I don't know how real they were. I will say this is not me reporting sources say as this is the offer. I will say, I think the Knicks, it's not like the Knicks were coming in and offering four for 60, you know, like, like the Knicks and it's not like the Knicks were saying, we don't want to extend you. We're pushing this off. Like, I think, I think the Knicks had a number they didn't want to go to. But but I, I do believe that their offer was like a real offer. Like, I don't think they were horribly lowballing him to the point that he's going to be horrifically offended. I, I believe it was somewhere. You know, I did a poll earlier this year, for example, of front office people where I spoke to 15, 16 front office people about um, what they think would be a fair extension number for quickly. And, and almost all of them said between 16 and, and 20 a year. And, and the numbers that I keep hearing from the Knicks were somewhere in that range. And I believe that the Knicks offers generally fell in the facility, uh, you know, the vicinity of that range. And I'm like, I mean, that's a real offer. It's not like an insult. Um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. If he comes out and he's freaking awesome this year and he averages 18, a game off the bench and he establishes himself as someone who can really play next to Brunson. And, and to me, by the way, I think it's oversimplified when we think of teams that want point guards and it's like, he doesn't have to be a point guard, but 
he can't with the way that he is right now be next to another small guard. So if your point yes. guard were say like if Lonzo ball could still play and your point guard were Lonzo ball, then quickly could be your two because sure. Lonzo could just guard the other team's best, best guard. And you're good. Go like if, combo. if drew holiday were your other guard quickly could be your two. If, if, if the Celtics guards were, if, if, if Derek White were your other yeah. guard, if, if, if Marcus Smart were your other guard, like quickly could come in and be there. The problem is that they have Jalen Brunson and that's just going to slide everybody down. Now you kind of have two small guards at the top of your defense and that's going to be a problem. Uh, and that's why Brunson, there's a little bit of a blockade for quickly being able to start just because Brunson is so damn good. But like he could start next to a point guard. It just has to be not some small point guard who plays small and has to be hidden defensively. You brought up Brunson. So I'll just, I had a thought before I'll, I'll uh, vocalize it now. I think the only way that the, the doomsday scenario that I mentioned before for Leon Rose, at least not, not a doomsday scenario for quickly um, comes to pass is if like Brunson misses not I don't know, significant time, but like there's a, let's say there's a 20 game stretch or something where Brunson's out quickly starts a point guard. And it's like, 22 and seven or something. And like the Knicks have a winning record during that time. And he's like very clearly one of their, one of their two best players. Like just so there's that much more proof of concept, but I agree you, you nailed it with the playoff thing. Like he needs to, he needs to play well in the playoffs. By the way, John, yeah, that's on the table. That happened last year. It did. Yeah. That, that like, what did he average when he started as a starter? He averaged 19 point, 19 point something. Uh, Maybe Andrew has to fact check that for me. I thought it was 19 point something. On like good percentages, like it yeah, wasn't it's, it's, some it's, sort it's, of it was efficient. Yeah, absolutely. He had he had incredible mo- like that game in Boston last year was one of the best moments for them of the season. I think it was the best regular season moment. They- that won him six man, of the, or I shouldn't say oh, that won him six man of the year. <laughs> but I thought at the moment that was going to win him six man of the year. You yeah. know, like that that was like that was like a moment. That was like a really special moment for him. I mean, he had another game where he had forty. Near the end yep. of the year, like he was balling out as a starter. So if he comes in and goes for 20, 22 a game and they win with Brunson out, like, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, he's a very good player. So that's totally possible. Mayo quickly last year averaged 22.6 points per game as a starter. I undersold him. There you go. There you go. So not only can he do it, he literally did it. I'm going to, do you know who asked, by the way, or if it was even a question that was posed to Quentin Grimes? Quentin Grimes gave the soundbite, whatever it was, a few weeks ago. They said maybe Mitch is our most like important player. Um, I don't know if somebody asked that explicitly to him, but like, do you remember? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Well, neither it would take, either. that would take me paying attention. <laughs> That's, I honestly we, don't remember. We, we don't ask that much of you here. Um, who would your top three most indispensable uh, Knicks be? Jalen Brunson. So I have indispensable. I have the same one. Uh, at one, yes. Well, that's no brainer. I think. I well, is it a no brainer for? Is that? Do you think it's a no brainer? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I. I'm not. I'm. Just, you're looking at me. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just posing that other people might, might, might not agree. Would say Julius. No, I. No, I, I'm not going in that direction. I think people might might argue that Brunson is it, 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 it's not a runaway that he's the most indispensable Nick because Emmanuel quickly should Brunson go down could step in and again they're the biggest fans of Emmanuel quickly probably think quickly could step in and do a, a decent approximation of Brunson if Brunson were to go out quickly could step in and do a really good approximation of Brunson because quickly is really good, but Jalen yeah, Brunson. Go is a all-star caliber player. And not only that, he, that dude sets the tone of the locker room. Like he's the guy, like we saw Julius Randall's shot selection change last year. And obviously the number one person that you credit with that is Julius Randall. Cause he's the one who did it. Number two person you credit with that up for debate. We could say Tom Thibodeau, who has been telling him to take more threes for you know, every day for 900 consecutive days, just screaming at him to take more threes. There was like, you know, like I heard there was a, there was a, there was a time when like a, a couple of years ago when, when Tibbs was really just beaten into Randall to take more, take more threes. Cause that was his whole thing. It's like just wanting him to get rid of those long mid range and Tibbs was just beating into Randall to do it. 
and and Julius made a couple of shots and and from three and Tibbs was like yelling at him being like see keep doing it and Julius sarcastically was just like sarcastically was just like yeah maybe I'll just do it every time and Tibbs was like yes yes exactly <laughs> now you understand yeah, that's what I want <laughs> you finally understand me yeah exactly. uh, but what's funny I think Julius has really come across on it, but but a huge part of the equation and I really think Julius's mentality has very much changed about that stuff for the better. But I think a big part of the equation is Jalen Brunson. He respects Brunson so much. He's such a presence in that locker room. Uh, the way he includes all the other guys. Uh, I, I think, man, I, I, I used so to Brunson be one won. of the people. Oh, yeah. sorry. I, did, I thought you were done talking about Brunson. Keep going, please. No, I was going to say, I used to be one of the people who was like, uh, who cares about the locker room stuff? It couldn't be that big of a deal. And after nine years of covering the NBA, I'm like, it's such a big deal. Oh, I care. I think it's a big deal. I have not covered the NBA for nine years. Yeah, uh, it's it's such a big deal. Yeah, Brunson won for sure. Uh, I mean, two, two is Randall. Okay. You know what? After my whole thing, um, Brunson is one for sure. I'm going to say Randall is one. No, no, you're not. Yeah, I think I am. No, I'm not. I'm going to say Randall is two. Randall is two because they're, they're, if Randall goes down for a significant period of time, like they are really going to miss his size. Yeah. Like they are really going to miss it. And he gets too much crap from everybody. Yep. Julius Randall is a very good basketball player and had so, many huge moments for them where he won them games last year yeah. and was not good in the playoffs, but he was also really hurt in the playoffs. And I don't think it's fair for us to act like we know for sure that he was bad in the playoffs last last year for the same reason he was bad in the playoffs in the, in the Atlanta series. I'm more I chalking agree. up to like, I don't know. I just don't know. He's so important to them. I think he's come in with a really good mentality this year. He was talking about how his goal for this season is to be even more efficient than he was last year. And last year he was more efficient than he was during his first all NBA season. And I was talking to him about like what he, I was like, so what are you going to do? You're going to take even more threes. And he was like, no, I don't, I don't think I need to take more, which is by the way, totally reasonable. He took like eight and a half last year. It's a ton of threes. He was a ridiculous in the league threes. in, in yeah. total threes taken or something like that. Yeah. He took an insane amount of threes, he took like eight and a half a game. Like he doesn't need to take more, but he was saying, I mean, I thought it was a really smart observation. He was saying like, no, I think, I think the types of threes that I can take can be different though. Like he took a That's bunch good. of threes off the dribble last year and he was talking more trying to relocate so he can shoot off the catch and that kind of stuff. And so he's saying all the right things. And so, so I think, and, and look, I mean, he was so good last year that that playoff run really put a damper on what, what should have been looked at as such a, such a successful season for him. Fantastic. Uh, season. Yeah, totally. And, and I really think I'd have Julius number two and number three, I, I, I'm going to write down my prediction for what you are going to say, but you say it. Mitchell Robinson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know my friend cats. <laughs> yeah. So much of what they do is just Mitch, just gobbling up offensive boards. Yeah. You know, but, but good. I think with the way this team is constructed, number three is kind of matchup dependent. Like that's, fair. On, that's good point. on, on any given night, the answer could be RJ or the answer could be quickly or the answer could be hard could be because could be Grimes because some team like like if if they're playing a team that's going to guard them by saying screw it anytime any player in the starting lineup gets one step inside the three point arc, we are helping everybody is collapsing into the lane. They're not doing shit. And now all of a sudden, maybe it's Grimes. Because on that team also, Grimes is also guarding Jimmy Butler. And now Grimes has got to shut down Jimmy Butler and he's going to have to hit. He's going to have to raise up for like 12 threes in that game. And now it's Grimes as number three guys. So like, I think it's this the way this team is constructed where so many guys are so similar in talent level, even the ones who provide different things in terms of style, like Grimes and Quickly are so different in terms of their style. But it's not like they're crazy different in terms of their talent level, uh, you know, because of the way this team is constructed. Like, I think number three could be more of a rotational thing, but I, I kind of have to say Mitch because he's their most important defender. 
when he plays great defensively, they tend to play well defensively. And his offensive rebounding is so tremendously important. And I also really, really rely on his post-game quotes for my story. Still waiting for the definitive Mitch story from Fred Katz, but we'll, it'll, it's going to happen this year. I know it's. I thought happen. that was the ride in the D train story. I told. Oh, yeah, I, the right, okay. Yeah, I told. I told. I told Ryan Archidiacono that after I told him like like last week that after he, he was traded last year, I did a story on all of the dick jokes that Mitch made throughout the season, and and Ryan was baffled by the fact that that story existed. He was like, I cannot believe you did that. He was like, did you? He was like, did you break Mitch's confidence to do that? I was like, dude, I went up to him and said, hey, Mitch, can I write a story about all the dick jokes you made this year and listed out the dick jokes? And Mitch just yelled to me, yeah, man, the people got to know. <laughs> he is. I'm so, so definitely happy. not. Definitely not. Someone got on me uh, a few weeks ago because I wrote that one of the things I was excited about this year is for Mitch to get to inch closer to being the longest tenured Nick in terms of consecutive like seasons played with the team uh, since like the 90s. Because right now it's mellow and uh, not that I don't love mellow, but I think it would be kind of funny if Mitch passed mellow and, and he has a little ways to go. But like these are the reasons why I'm very proud of that of, of that goal for for Mitch. Well, did I did I ever tell you the story of what Mitch said to me the day that story came out. I don't think you did. What, what was it? It's so good. Uh, so for those who don't know, Mitch became obsessed with this New York post headline last year when the Knicks were on this great defensive run. And the, the headline was riding the D tram, which was a pun on the subway. But Mitch obviously interpreted the extremely lewd meaning of that and didn't even think about the subway. And so all Mitch did for months was make riding the D train jokes to all the beat writers. And he just, it made all of us so happy every time he did it. It just, it never failed to get a laugh. It was so funny every time. I was like, I got to write a story about this. It's just, he's so funny. So the day that story comes out, I walk into the locker room. It's in Indiana at the end of the season. I walk into the locker room before the game and Mitch gives me a look. And, And Mitch, as I've said on this podcast before, only calls me Matthew, which is my legal first name. And he just shakes his head at me. He goes, Matthew, you really screwed me. And I was like, I was like, what, what do you mean? You didn't like the story? And he said, you're just going to write all that stuff. You're not even going to ask my permission. I said, Mish, there's a whole section in, in the story about me asking you your permission (laughs) and you saying, yeah, the people got to know. And, and he said, he said, oh, well, I don't remember that happening. And I said, and and I said, did you read the story, Mitch? And he says, no, of course not. I'm just fucking with you. I'd never read your stuff. (laughs) That is a great story. Um, All right. We have to finish this up. I hold on one. uh, This is an exceptional interview. Really, really organized by me. Last quickly thing that I meant to ask you 15 minutes ago. uh, At the very end, do you think the sides were uh, not close? Let's say. Yeah, I, 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 I'll say this. I never got the impression they were close. Okay. That's, that's I, I, I never got like, oh, if only they could agree on this. Thing. Normally, when negotiations are close, I get like, oh, if only they could agree on this one thing. Oh, if only they came down this much. Like, I don't think there was, there was a world in which they were close and they don't get it done. I'll I, put it that way. That makes logical sense. For if sure. you're close, you get it done. There's a deadline. You get it done. Somebody says, screw it. Just, just, just do it. You know? Um, and in the time that we have left, um, I do want to ask you about a uh, story that came out today for the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, written by Keith Pompey, who oh. I, uh, we've talked about before. You've mentioned he is uh, an exceptional uh, beat reporter for Philly. Um, really on top of, of what they do. And uh, the story essentially is that, um, as should surprise no one, Leon Rose uh, has made Joel Embiid. If, 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 very big if, he becomes available, um, he, you know, Rose, Rose wants him. Leon, Leon wants him here in New York. Uh, the story mentioned that there was a, a potential, pa- you know, basically a package would be like here, pick three of these players. And I think it's Randall, Barrett, uh, Mitch, which would make sense because Joel Embiid is the center. And, uh, and Evan Fournier, ostensibly for salary purposes. And then, you know, some first round picks. 
what I wanted to ask you, just two two quick ones on this. One, um, your thoughts on yeah, 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 quick, quick. We'll be real quick, as quick as as is possible. Your thoughts on the report, um, and well, let's start with there. Let's. See, I want your thoughts on the report, and then I have a, a follow up. My thoughts on the report. First of all, I'll say, as a reporter, I have to put out there, I have not confirmed this information, so I'm not reporting it. However, as as you just said, Keith Pompey is a like an awesome beat reporter. He's been covering the Sixers forever and is totally on their pulse. And Keith doesn't like. It's not like a shit stir, you know, like he's not just like throwing stuff out there for the sake of it. When, when, when he puts something out there, there's, there's something to it. So I believe it. I mean, we've all, we've all been waiting for them to make a Joel Embiid move. Uh, I don't think the organization believes that Embiid becomes available until next summer at the absolute earliest, if at all, uh, I don't think really, I haven't really spoken to anybody in the league, to be honest, who thinks that Embiid becomes available during the season. No one in the league who I've spoken to has told me like they think that's what's going to happen. So I, I'm not counting on it happening. However, it's the NBA. So who the hell knows? Like, that's what I keep saying to everybody. Everybody keeps saying to me, he's not going to become available till next summer. And I'm like, how do you know that? I, no one knows. It's the NBA. What if, what no if Philly... Mean. What if Philly just is total disarray and is terrible and James Harden refuses to show up and Daryl Morey is just like, well, we're not trading them till we get our good enough deal. And it's a Ben Simmons situation again. And the team goes to crap and, and Embiid's like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this for a second time in three years and have this team stink and miss my prime. Just, just save me, please. Like <laughs> we can all relate to that emotion. We can all relate to that emotion. And I'm not saying I'm predicting that to happen. I'm just saying that I, I, I have learned not to rule this crap out. Uh, I believe the Knicks are, I believed the Knicks were, you know, had Joel Embiid atop their list two days ago. And I believe it even more now that Giannis has extended. So I, that's, that's, that's the guy. That's the guy who, you know, I think they would, they would love to have. And as for the players that that Keith named in that report, I believe he said Fournier, Barrett, uh, Randall Mitchell, Mitchell Robinson, and Julius Randall would be on the table. Sure. I mean, I think when you're talking about a trade for Joel Embiid, especially the way the tra- the way the Knicks work with the way they negotiate trades like Brock Aller, when he, when he talks to other teams specifically, and we'll see who negotiates it because they, they like rotate and how they negotiate trades. Like, like one of, Richard, one Richard. of, well, kind of like one of the strengths and weaknesses of their front office is that they have a lot of voices, which can be a good thing. But I've also heard of numerous situations where it's led to communication mishaps with other teams where somebody talks to uh, one person in their front office, that person lays out priorities for a trade or opinions or whatever. And then somebody from that same team calls up another person in the front office two weeks later. And that person lays out different priorities, different goals, whatever. And it's like, well, what did the next one? Yeah. And that's sometimes why you get out this different stuff about them. Uh, and, and I think it can be a strength because you get smart people together, but when it's not, when, when communication falls apart, it can, it can, it can screw you up and it can be hard to trade with. One thing that Brock Aller likes to do in trade. So I've been told from, from people who talk to him with other teams is he'll just kind of call you up and just spitball about stuff. So like, just like, who do you like? What do you think of this guy? What do you think of that guy? What do you think of that guy? So. One thing that I'm very confident about is if if they are talking to the 76ers, they get to a point where they're talking to the 76ers about a Joel Embiid trade, everyone's name is going to come up. It's just the way it's going to be. So I'm sure those guys would be on the table, and I'm sure everybody else would be on the table too. That's what I figured. Um, so then follow question. and we'll- But you can't trade Fournier. I'll come be on. honest with you. The the forty eight thing was strange to me because as as you well know, forty eight has a team option for twenty four twenty five, and like, there's no scenario where like they'd want to guarantee they 
need to slash want to guarantee that salary for inclusion in a trade next summer? Yes, there is. What is it? It is if Philadelphia is breaking it down, starting over, and just wants an expiring contract and doesn't value R.J. Barrett. Thinks that R.J. Barrett's contract is too expensive and would rather just an expiring contract. Because you'd need to you need to have enough outgoing money, but in that scenario, just for argument's sake, they would not want either. Then they would. Then the only way I can imagine that being true is if they don't want two of the other three. Like they're definitively not interested in two of the other three names that were mentioned: Mitch, Randall, or RJ. Because that's the only way you need Fournier's salary, which I guess could be conceivable. That's conceivable. Sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? If Philly is if Philly is breaking it down to the studs, yeah, to the studs, and they're like, we're rebuilding. We want picks. We want young guys. That's it. Sure. They might not want Julius Randle. They might think Julius Randle is wonderful, but they might not want Julius Randle. Yeah. You know, they might they, they they might want Julius Randle in the same way that the Portland Trailblazers wanted uh, Drew Holiday, so they could spin him off. So maybe there's a third team or something. Or whatever, but I, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. Yeah, no, to, but, yes, to be clear. But like, man, wouldn't it be something if the NBA's financial system incentivized that 19 million dollar option on Evan Fournier actually being picked up? That's why I'm like, if Fournier, if Fournier doesn't get traded, like if I were him, I wouldn't take a buyout. I would not take a buyout. I would stick around and see if maybe there's a scenario in which that team option gets picked up. Because like, for example, the Knicks tossed around the possibility of they, they had Derek Rose's team option. That was about $15 million this summer. And they tossed around the possibility of picking up that team option in case they needed it for a trade. And they didn't have a specific trade on draft night. The problem is it's different than a non-guaranteed contract or something. The, the team option is going to have to be picked up before the start of free agency. So it really only works if, if you have at the very least the, 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 the bones of a trade figured out by around draft night. And if you don't have the bones of a trade figured out by around draft night, which is totally possible, they could, then, then you don't know whether or not to pick up the team option. And that's kind of what happened with Derek Rose, where they were like, we can't just pick it up with no plan at all. And then soar into the luxury tax because we've picked up a $15 million option on a guy who's not going to play. But if you have a plan for it, maybe you can do it. We're getting vastly ahead of ourselves here, but that that would, um, I would imagine that would be a dicey proposition in this scenario because uh, I, my guess would be again, someone who knows quite literally nothing um, that, more I just want to emphasize that you know quite literally nothing. Literally I nothing. Just, I think that should be the the tagline for the for podcast. this podcast. Don Mac yeah. knows quite literally nothing. Um, yeah. My guess would be Maury's last gasp would be give us until July first and let's see if we could use this cap space to to put you know player X or player Y around you, which is seems to be their their I get I don't know their backup plan, their plan A. I don't know whatever whatever plan number you want to give it, but that would not be decided by um, by draft night. Um, this is the last question I want to ask you. Why do you think a story like this comes out now? I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> I don't have the slightest clue because because okay, because Keith because Keith had multiple sources telling him the information. Okay, I, I I don't have the slightest clue. Okay, that's answers the question. Yeah, sorry, I have I no idea. I don't apologize. <laughs> So I think sometimes people read into the timing of the story. That's, that's what I'm getting at. There are a like, lot of people. Like, for example, yeah. for example, when I put out that story about Obi and Tibbs getting into the altercation oh, at, at the end of at the end of uh, one of the Heat series games, and so many people were like, oh, they're totally trading him. Look, Fred finally got the okay to write this. And like... I understand why people go there and they, they, they traded him and they were going to trade him, but that's not why I wrote it when I wrote it. And I never got the okay to write it. I like sat on that story. (laughs) I easily could have been scooped on that story. I sat on that story for two months because I just wanted to have as many voices as I could. And 
it felt like if I just like put it out there, like just randomly one week, it, it just, it felt so gossipy to me. And, and I felt like I needed to have a news hook in order to use that anecdote for something. And, and for me, the, the news hook was that Obi was coming up. He was extension eligible. And, you know, this, this colors the way the organization, this is, this is, uh, you know, a perfect way to depict exactly how things are going with him in the organization. And, and that was the news hook, but like, people were like, Oh, why do you think this is coming out now? It's because they're going to trade him in three days. And then they did trade him in three days, but it wasn't because of that. Like it was was a really cool coincidence. Dastardly Fred. Dastardly. Um, all right. I got nothing left to do with you. Um, this is, I have one thing because we are recording this about an hour before tip off of the NBA season opener. Oh yeah. So NBA insider who has a national platform as well at the athletic. Give us your finals pick right here on Nick's film school. Oh, that's a good one. Oh damn. You know, what's crazy. I don't have a finals pick. I haven't even made one yet. Well, now um, you need one. I do need one. We can't um, let you, we're not letting you leave until you give us your finals pick. Yeah. Uh, Boston in the East, Boston over Denver. Ooh, over, over Denver. Denver. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't have enough trust in Phoenix's health or depth. Uh, I don't have enough trust in Jaron Jackson Jr.'s ability to play the five when he gets into foul trouble so much. And I think that's going to be problematic for him with no Steven Adams there. Uh, Interesting that Memphis was the second team you brought up in the West. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared for this. The Lakers are quite good. I don't think they're as good as Denver. Uh, and, but I liked their off season a lot. Uh, Milwaukee, I'm worried about their perimeter defense. And if they're going to start like Malik Beasley, they're just going all in on offense and, and maybe Lopez and Giannis are enough defensively on the back end to make up for it. I'm certainly not ruling them out, but I, I, it just concerns me. I think Boston, if they're healthy is the best team, but they might not be. But one of the things that I think is so great about this year is that the days of the KD Warriors are over. And it's like, I genuinely don't know. Like, I, I don't know who's going to win the title. Like, I think, I think Cleveland could win the East. Hmm. Oh boy. That's a, that's a, that's a hot take for it. I hate to break it. Down. I picked, I picked Indiana to finish top six in the East. Saying no. Cleveland could win the East. Yeah. I don't think it's Cleveland could win the East. I mean, are you uh, assuming health there, Fred? Are you saying, because they are younger and because of an injury to Milwaukee or Boston because of certain players on their team could get hurt is plausible. Are you saying like they could benefit, they'd be the team to benefit from it. That's part of it. The other part of it is like, even if Milwaukee is, I think they like match up really well with Milwaukee, for example, because mm. they, they're oh, the only sure. team in the league that has, two like star guards who launches who who launched threes from 27 plus feet and Milwaukee's perimeter defenders are going to struggle against that. And if Milwaukee is going to play this type of defense, they've been trying in the preseason where they're just going to like try to force turnovers and try to get out on the run and all that. Like I'm sure there will be adjustments made throughout the season if it doesn't work and everything, but like, Cleveland doesn't really turn the ball over much, though we did see them turn the ball over a lot during the first round series against the Knicks. And and I also think, like, I don't know, Knicks fans were just all crapping on Mobley and Allen for being soft in the playoffs. And I just had, quite honestly, I had the exact opposite reaction in, in relation to Evan Mobley. Exact opposite. Everyone's like, oh, he's soft. He couldn't handle Mitchell Robinson. He got destroyed. He totally got destroyed. Mitchell Robinson was the best player in that series. He got He got annihilated. My reaction was, yeah, he's 21 and he's awesome. No. And this was his first playoff series. So you know what's the most likely result from all of this? That he comes back with a massive chip on his shoulder this year. Is like, I guess the way that I did it last year doesn't work, learns from it, and wreaks havoc on the whole freaking league. So I I that's what great players do. I think he's gonna be a great player. You know, it took okay. took Kobe Bryant airballing a couple of a couple yeah. of threes against Utah before he became Kobe Bryant. Not saying he's gonna be that good. I do think he is gonna he's gonna win a defensive player of the year at some point in his career. Uh 
Maybe uh, this year. I do think he has a lot more offensively to give. Uh, I do think that Mitchell and Garland's uh, are going to have another year of chemistry. I do think that um, adding adding um, George Niang and Max Truce were really, really good additions for them when they couldn't find a fifth guy during that Knicks series. And now all of a sudden, like Niang is making quick decisions in the corner and hitting threes. Like, I, I like that team. I think that team's legit good. And by the way, Garland is really young and insanely good and will probably get better. This is John. This is the take I gave on the the town hall. That the and then you wait. You said it was the not the chase down. The, you, this was during the the crossover with Alex and Gavin. Oh yeah, I miss I miss. They just been spending too much time over at the chase the chase down. Regardless, and they, and, and 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 Dean Wade is going to win MVP. Obviously, I don't think he's on the Cavs anymore. But no, um, no, he's not. But he's going to win MVP. So then, Cavs, last anyway. last official thing before we let you go. I have one more, but oh, okay. Then, then John has one more last official thing. Just where's your, where do you have the Knicks then? Since you said where you have Cleveland and the other two teams. I picked them fourth. Fourth. Okay. So um, I have them, I have them fourth. Um, Cause I have no idea what to do with Philly. Same. I just have no idea. So I was like, I'll throw Philly five. And I feel like there's kind of a gap. And then I, I put Indiana six and uh, I admire that. I had them sixth for the longest time in my picks. And then I chickened out and put them eighth. And when I saw that you put them six, I was like, ah, I, I would have dude. had an ally. Oh, well, Fred, uh, you're the best. Uh, everybody out there, uh, subscribe to The Athletic. Read Fred Katz. Follow Fred Katz uh, at Fred Katz on all your social media platforms. Uh, we didn't really talk about it that much today, but Fred had an exceptional long, but also like it's long, but it's like a very quick read because it's like all over the place in a good way. Covers quite literally every base you could possibly want covered on the 23, 24 Knicks. Um, really, if you could like only read one thing um, about the impending Knicks season, because you just kind of want to get caught up because you've been out of the loop the, the off season, read this because uh, it's really good. Um, did I forget anything? Did I miss anything? The link to the preview is in the description for the podcast. That's there you go. Got to plug it. that work. 